All right. Well, I think we'll uh, get started. It's two o'clock. Um, so I want to make sure that, you know, everybody, uh, we're glad to, to have you guys here. Um, you know, it's definitely difficult for all of us uh, to be kind of home when we really want to be out in the field as much as possible. So we're trying to do these types of events to really uh, make sure that we're staying in contact with you, you all and letting you know exactly what's going on. Um, so first, what I would like to do is introduce Stormy. Uh, hey, uh, introduce yourself first. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so I'm Robert, um, the events coordinator at uh, Center for Coastal Studies. Um, so I've been there since September. So for those of you who haven't met me at Nappies or any of our other community events, I'm uh, I'm now working for the center full time. So I'm very happy to, to see and hear all of you. Um, what we're going to do today is Stormy's going to give a bit of a presentation about uh, the right whales, kind of the state of right whales right now. Um, and then what you guys can do is, uh, as you guys have questions at the end, um, just type them in the chat box and I will relay them to Stormy and he'll be able to answer them all to the best of his ability. And with his, you know, hundreds of years of experience, I think uh, he'll, he'll be able to answer almost all of them. <laughs> ah. So yeah, so uh, Stormy Mayo, he's our director of right whale ecology, and he will uh, get started for you guys. So um, I can't uh, see most of you. In fact, I can't see any of you. So forgive me. I'd like to be able to get a look at you, but uh, but I think uh, we'll just have to pretend now. Um, so I would uh, really quickly um, actually give somewhat of an update on right whales in general and Cape Cod Bay uh, specifically. Um, and I'll say something about, uh, about those aspects. So the, the goal today is um, just looking at what the present status is as of just quite recently. Uh, and also a little bit on the work we're doing in Cape Cod Bay. And I might say with the COVID-19 issue, um, also a little bit about what we're not able to do uh, because of, um, of our attention to the whole business of sequestering and being careful. Uh, I'm in my home uh, here in Provincetown, um, place that I've lived uh, as a kid and uh, where my father brought me up with, with my mother um, years ago. And uh, although Robert just said hundreds of years, uh, it's a long time, but not quite that long. Um, who is the right whale? I'll just give a couple of uh, bits of information because some of you may not know what this whale looks like. If you're on Cape Cod, that'll also help you uh, know something about uh, what you're looking for off the beaches because these whales uh, right now, in fact, are being seen off of the beaches here. Um, a little bit about why the concern about right whales, basically the status of the population, pretty much up to date. Uh, what we're doing at the, the center. Um, and then um, lastly, I'll try to uh, say something about what the future of the right whale looks like in these very difficult times. Uh, then I hope we'll have questions. And again, those will be relayed uh, through uh, Robert. Um, so I, I always have to lead with a, a look at our research teams. Uh, they are uh, the um, really the uh, centerpiece of our efforts. Uh, and this is a look on the top at our some of our flight teams through the years. We've been flying since 1998. And on the bottom layer, you're seeing a number of us uh, on the boat because we do a lot of research uh, from the vessel. And that's been going on since 1984. So we have a very long uh, set of observations. Uh, the right whale is an extraordinary animal. It has uh, a huge tail, probably gosh, I guess about uh, as much as uh, 18 to 20 feet across, a giant uh, power uh, propeller for a, uh, a huge broad animal that you'll see a few pictures of 
uh, through this talk. Uh, the right whale has a V spout. So those of you who are along the New England coast, uh, keep an eye out. Uh, and if you see spouts, and those spouts have a V, as you see in the upper uh, left corner, um, if that is a V, in other words, it's two separate spouts of, wa of water or mist, uh, that often is a right whale. If you see it from the side, of course, it looks like a single, but keep an eye out. And if you see that V, that was what my ancestors and, and the settlers here used to identify right whales off the beach. And in fact, it was what they used to, uh, to see whether they should launch boats and uh, try to uh, hunt them. So it kind of was one of the more difficult parts of the story. They have a broad um, flippers, uh, flippers that are paddle shaped. And when they're in their mating behavior, you'll often see those above the surface. If you're out on Cape Cod, one of the places where you see much of this is along the outer edge of Provincetown where we are. And hence uh, our, our project has developed here. Uh, because the whales come right up close to the beach at Herring Cove and Race Point. So keep an eye out for those. And then there is that very odd look. Uh, right whales have a have a very, almost an ugly looking um, uh, look to their faces. They're covered with roughened skin patches that I'll say more about in a moment. Um, they do not have a dorsal fin, as you'll see in this uh, in this shot. And again, those are all things that you would use if you wanted to identify uh, right whales uh, off the beach. And in Cape Cod, uh, you can sometimes uh, see them so close to the beach, one of the closest places uh, along the Atlantic coast. Uh, you can sometimes get good photos if you've got a reasonable telephoto. Uh, right whales are very broad. Uh, these are various aspects of their, of their morphology. I'll be showing you a number of images from our, uh, our uh, uh, air survey team, a very important part of our project and a really um, extraordinary group of people uh, who fly our surveys, uh, really about as talented as, as you can imagine, uh, flying um, uh, close to the surface in the midwinter. And they get photos like this. And you can see the nostrils are on the top of the head called the blowholes. Uh, this whale has its mouth open, so there's sort of a, um, uh, sheets of material hanging down from their jaws. We'll see a little more of that in a moment. And of course, their broad tails. The eye, you can see, is deep beneath the surface, maybe six to eight feet beneath the surface. Uh, this whale, I'm just estimating at 45 feet long. Uh, this is an old friend that we'll see more of in a while, uh, a whale that we called um, and I think I can point it out with my cursor if you can see it, uh, because of this open spot in the, uh, in the callosity, the roughened skin patch, uh, we call this whale wart. Uh, wart doesn't know what we call her, so she doesn't mind uh, whatever name we gave her, but uh, the naming is an important part of our work. Right whales are found around the world. Um, we, of course, are along this coast, the Atlantic coast, um, uh, and, uh, and yet they are found on both uh, the east and west coasts. The west coast uh, whales are also uh, part of this uh, group uh, in the North Pacific. So there's a North Pacific right whale here along the, um, the west coast of North America and then over on the east coast of Asia, uh, there are also right whales and uh, different species. And then another species which is found here, as you can see in green, along the southern hemisphere, that's called the southern right whale. So there are three species, but it's the northern right whale uh, that we have here that is so very close to extinction uh, that we'll show you more about in a moment. Uh, in our local area, we're in the Gulf of Maine over here, and right whales sometimes go all the way south to the coast of Florida, and it's always kind of misunderstood that the right whales that go down there are principally animals associated with uh, calving behavior. So it may be calves uh, born there, uh, and that's a critical area because it is a calving ground. Uh, and those whales have come down along the East Coast uh, from our uh, local area in the Gulf of Maine up here.
come down to the coast uh, of Georgia and Florida. Uh, there used to be right whales across much of the eastern Atlantic over here, uh, but those have been uh, extirpated. They were killed off starting in the 1100s right here in the, uh, in the Bay of Biscay where the first hunting happened in the 1100s. Uh, and then whaling continued uh, working towards the west. Uh, the uh, situation in this Cape Cod Bay area is particularly important, and I will emphasize that repeatedly. Uh, this is a critical habitat for feeding, nursery, and socializing of right whales. Not just some right whales, but this last year, more than 60% of the estimated population of the entire North Atlantic came into our small embayment here in the hook of Cape Cod. Uh, this year, um, uh, Amy tells me that as of, uh, of our last survey flights, which were suspended because of the uh, virus, uh, we already had 170 individuals recorded in Cape Cod Bay and some recorded down here south of Nantucket. Uh, so we have a remarkable number of animals in this rare population uh, feeding as here with their mouths open. Uh, later in the year, in fact, right about now, they begin to, begin to bring their calves uh, up here from their calving grounds in the south. And then we'll see socializing uh, behavior, aggregations of right whales that come together in, in huge concentrations. Right whales were hunted extensively, and this is a, uh, an estimate of, of what happened to the population in the 16 and 1700s. In, uh, in this coastline and along uh, the shores of the high latitude North Atlantic. And you can see uh, several different models uh, show the radical decline in the population in this pink area when hunting, uh, the, uh, the early hunting uh, here off Cape Cod and uh, all the way north to Labrador uh, decimated the population, which already had been decimated on the, uh, in the Eastern Atlantic al along the coast of Europe. And the population dropped to some unknown number. The models, some of the models suggest that we may have started with as many up here as, uh, as 20,000 individuals and the population dropped perhaps to as few as, as uh, three females remaining. It's not clear how many males there were, but the genetics um, uh, have suggested that um, maybe as low as eight individual females uh, were found in the population in this early period. Uh, that would be in the 1700s. And then the population dropped so low that hunting wasn't profitable and the population began to come back. And the last uh, image you see here is the population estimate of in the 300 to 350 animals in the early 1990s. Uh, all of this, which seems like lots of numbers, is critically important to understanding where we are and also to, uh, to doing the very important work of management. So lots of hunting. This was an image uh, from the Nantucket Historical Association of a right whale being flensed. You can see the the layers of, of blubber are being cut off. This may have been in Provincetown. Uh, what's happening now, and then we'll get out of the, of the numbers game, um, is uh, shown right here. Uh, it is uh, really based on uh, the remarkable work of a bunch of different scientists using a lot of our data to show where statistically the population of right whales seems to have gone. And everyone seems to rest on this model. You've heard a lot about models and curves. So uh, these days you, you know what's going on with that. And, um, and this model here that shows uh, 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 where my uh, cursor is, is we think the best model. And that showed that the population started to decline in 2010 and dropped uh, so that in 2017, it was at 411 uh, individuals. Uh, the fact that it has gone from this slow increase you see on the left to a slow decrease 
is one of the very troubling events in the story. And we believe that right now, there are probably now, we may be down to as few as the high 390s. So the population appears to be in a collapse. And so that really is a critical part of the story. It is easy to understand because extinction is simple arithmetic. It's births minus mortalities, and that is the trajectory. And the trajectory is down, so we've got to deal with this question of births and mortalities. Um, here's a look at the birth side of it. And uh, the numbers by year are on the left. These, this is information that comes from our colleagues working off the coast of Florida and Georgia doing air surveys. <clears throat> so relative to calves, uh, this year we have 10 individuals, and that may seem great, and it is actually, compared to what we had down here in 2018 when no calves were born. Uh, we had very low numbers. You can see the numbers are quite low from 2017 all the way to 2020 uh, when we have uh, 10, as best we can tell. But if you look at uh, the fluctuations uh, of calving, and that's in blue, and uh, what I've done is approximated, uh, last night I tried this out, approximated different estimates uh, that uh, are uh, based on uh, information from the Southern Hemisphere right whales. Uh, the Southern Hemisphere right whales are calving at about 7% of their population. And here you've got a green line, which is the 7% estimate that I came up with last night. That may not be fair for reasons you'll see in a moment, so at 5%, here's what the calving should have looked like. And what you can see is, uh, these are calves on this uh, coordinate and the years here. And what you can see is that over the years, the population has fluctuated a, gr a great deal. But in the years since about 2010, when that decline started, the right whale calving has been extremely low and uh, it's lower than what we estimate they should be producing. And that, of course, in that arithmetic that I showed earlier, is pretty critical. Uh, so if we look back at some of the questions that relate to why the calving is low, we know that the number of females in the population, from work we and our colleagues do, um, the number of females is much lower than the number of males. Uh, it should be a 50-50 ratio but the females on which we depend for the future of the population are lower by a considerable amount uh, than, than the males. This is from Richard Pace's landmark work and, and other authors. Um, and you can see the numbers uh, teased out from that original curve that I showed you, uh, demonstrating that right whale females are lower than males. And that is a pretty critical issue uh, Pace and his colleagues, Peter Corcoran and, uh, and Scott Krauss, uh, have demonstrated uh, that we've got a problem within the population, and it is, uh, to some of us, very troubling. The other half is mortalities, and it's one that you many of you have already heard. It's, um, it's the uh, other, other half of that simple arithmetic. And now for mortalities, we know we have a high rate of uh, entanglement mortality on the right, uh, the, the right uh, images, and on the left, uh, images of whales struck by ships. And uh, there have been quite a few ship strikes, uh, blunt traumas, and whales lost to, um, to uh, entanglement. So uh, I suppose after all of these rather grim views, uh, but a little like COVID-19, you have to deal with reality. Uh, we have tried to do a number of things. Uh, and in the aerial surveillance area, we're working on trying to get images of whales, looking at demography uh, and distribution that I'll show you in a moment. Uh, and Unfortunately, with the COVID-19, uh, my guess is we will put in about half of the effort. We are uh, considered uh, essential under the uh, governor's guidelines because we are working uh, with critically endangered animals uh, and fisheries interactions. And uh, 
And so with very, very strict rules that have come down from uh, the Center for Coastal Studies and in keeping with the uh, governor's uh, guidelines, uh, we will be attempting to get some information, but I anticipate about half of the effort that we've done before. And this uh, may change considerably our capacity to manage the last right whales that come here to the bay. Uh, the work we do um, is taking pictures of images by my research team. I'm not allowed in the aircraft, so um, it's uh, up to a really crack group of, uh, of photographers who work in very difficult conditions at very low altitudes, taking images of whales. They'll be taking pictures of the uh, callosity of the whales. And my cursor, if you can see it, is is showing the bonnet callosity. Here's the mouth line. You can see there are roughened skin patches on the chin. The eyes are, be, are below this uh, skin patch, the callosity after the term callus. Um, the eyes are, are uh, right here beneath the, uh, the eyebrow callosities. The callosities are, are, as you see up here, in, are really black, but they're infested by uh, tiny organisms that look like lice. They're not lice, but they look like them, convergent evolution, and they color the roughened black skin patches a light color. And that means that our air survey teams and the teams from the vessel can photograph uh, the whales uh, and know who they are. There on the right, you can see there's a whale and our photographers are taking images. And even probably on this small screen, you can see there are roughened skin patches, which are individually distinctive. Uh, in, the, uh, in the aircraft, uh, this is a look, I think probably at Amy or Bridget taking images of right whales uh, from a thousand feet above the surface, traveling at about a hundred knots. Uh, the aircraft in the upper left, a, a specially designed aircraft, and you see five right whales and you can actually see just the the glimmer of their callosities. Uh, her photographs will be very close, of course, taken with a telephoto, good specialized gear and excellent photographer means every one of those whales will be identifiable. I think actually there may be four instead of five. Um, so uh, here's just a look at one of the whales. This is Ruffian 3530. All of these whales are given numbers uh, that are used by uh, the scientists working on right whales. And Ruffian is the name for this animal, uh, severely injured uh, by entanglements and ship strike. And a look at uh, Iceland and her new calf, new as of 2017. And you can see how the callosities, while they're generally similar, uh, the scars and callosities are individually distinctive. And in the hands of photographers from the boat or from the aircraft, it's possible to know who the whales are, to match them to catalogs maintained by the North Atlantic right whale catalog. Um, we contribute all of our information to it. Between 10 and 12,000 images a year are usually taken by our project. Uh, this year, because of the COVID-19 uh, and our, caution, our precautionary approaches, we probably will take uh, quite a few fewer than that. But you can see the images are matched to catalogs. And then we, uh, and we fly uh, over the bay uh, using tracks. Uh, those tracks uh, here in yellow are the actual flights, uh, flight patterns uh, flown by the Center for Coastal Studies team. Uh, this was in 2017 on the 17th. And this was the biggest number of right whales, I think certainly the biggest concentration ever seen uh, and recorded in the North Atlantic. Um, in terms of concentration, it was extraordinary. They identified 203 individual whales on uh, this one flight. Uh, out of that, we get information on distribution through the years. Uh, you can see they come quite close to the beach and that information is used directly by the Division of Marine Fisheries to manage the whales. In our habitat quality studies, we look um, at uh, zooplankton characteristics. That's the boat work that we do. 
Again, because of COVID-19, we will have uh, probably half or less than half of the of the effort we expect to have. Uh, we take information on the food of the animals and we check the oceanography and through uh, another project at the center, uh, the water quality is analyzed. Uh, this is an effort to protect this very, very special location where the last right whales aggregate. Work is uh, done in the laboratory. We don't, we're not now working in the laboratory anymore. The laboratory has been closed. Uh, because of uh, the, the uh, viral issues. Uh, so uh, we're looking at feeding whales and trying to understand them um, and uh, identify individual plankton. We won't be doing that in the lab uh, for a while now, but it will be uh, when we do collect information, it will be preserved and we'll be able to resurrect the stories of uh, this unusual year. That's just a look at the filtering mechanism, the big filter net of right whales. Uh, and a look from, a, from an aircraft, I often say people think that right whales are some of the um, uh, sweetest and most gentle animals. If you were a copepod uh, with those giant mouths, there are five of them there, uh, wide open, uh, you're seeing the white tongues in the floor of the mouth. Um, if you were a copepod, you would think they were anything but gentle creatures. Uh, these whales are uh, consuming at immense quantities of, uh, of plankton. Um, the, uh, this is just a look at how the plankton seen on the right in orange, work done by Christy Hudak uh, uh, from her uh, vessel information. Uh, that is a distribution of plankton predicted from our samples. And on the left, you see where on that same day the air survey team uh, found uh, found the right whales, the yellow spots. And you can see more and more we're beginning to be able to predict, even in our small habitat, where they're likely to be based on where the plankton is. And that gives the, um, that gives the, the um, uh, managers from the state of Massachusetts a good idea of, uh, of where, uh, where they ought to be managing them. And the last I'd like to mention is disentanglement. Then we can get perhaps to questions if there are any. Uh, we have an extremely active disentanglement program. It began here uh, off of Provincetown and through the efforts of Dave Matilla and uh, Scott Landry, who are carrying on that work. Uh, Dave is, is uh, taking to the rest of the world, really, uh, to uh, I think now over 30 countries the methods that we use here so that whales, marine mammals in general can be disentangled from, uh, from fishing gear, which is taking, uh, I think, tens of thousands of whales and dolphins and porpoises every year. Uh, so disentanglement is important here because it's dealing with these nearly extinct right whales and it is the focus of our disentanglement team. I think I can show you a, a gentle picture of a right whale just a short image of uh, a videotape of a right whale being disentangled, one that was was successfully disentangled. Dave Matilla and I. There's the cup. And now we're going to remove the, uh, no, the rope. So removing the rope. And that whale was uh, successfully disentangled. And I, the last I'd like to show you about um, whale disentanglement relates to work that our disentanglement team did um, with that whale ro uh, wart that we saw earlier. Uh, here she is, turns out it's a big female. And in 2008, uh, uh, we had her with a rope in her mouth, 2009, still rope in her mouth. 2010, an alarming change. Um, uh, the rope seems to have uh, gotten wrapped over her rostrum. You can see the rope now here. And then uh, in May, uh, the disentanglement team led by Scott uh, Landry in May uh, disentangled uh, this whale, Wart. Uh, and we see our uh, aircraft images of her 
uh, from 2010. The product of that uh, is amplified. Here is Wart with some of her young calves and some of her more recent ones. And it shows you how, if you can save a reproductively mature female, here's Wart in the middle, and here are her calves uh, arrayed around her. And then uh, calves, again, all identified by um, images of their callosities. This whale slalom uh, shows here a total of five calves. So I said it amplifies. If Ward had died, well, this was in 82 when slalom was born. Uh, but, um, but you can imagine that if she had died earlier, all of this productivity would have been lost. And that is an important part of the disentanglement effort and of the state's efforts to manage uh, fishing gear. So um, I thank you for listening. It's been a little longer than I anticipated, uh, but now I'm certainly uh, happy to, uh, uh, to um, uh, join you and uh, see if we can, if I can figure out how to do this. Uh, I will try to answer questions, but I'm trying to figure that. Am I visible? Okay. Um, if uh, if uh, you can, uh, why don't you uh, see if there are any questions that people have? All right. So, uh, first question was from Katie Reed, and she had asked if uh, you had any guesses as to why um, the population was and is still skewed towards males. Yeah, that's an uh, an important question. Uh, and let me go back before I speak to that. Imagine if we found out um, what uh, most of the imagined causes of the low calving are, including this one of the skew in the, in the uh, gender ratio. Um, if it is ecosystem, if it is uh, some of the issues of entanglement and stress and the stress of calving, which is part of the possibility, how would we then reduce it? Uh, so it, the problem most of us have is whatever's going on, we can't imagine how we would manage any of the things we can guess. The guesses, and they are, they have some solid uh, data associated with them, uh, relate to, um, the females, um, uh, first of all, females generally are under more stress because they are calving and because uh, in the case of right whale females, they're calving to areas where they don't feed down in the south. Uh, calving itself is a stress. The long migration is a stress. And uh, the nursing is a stress. And if you add to those uh, any entanglements, which nearly all right whales have had, you pile that on top of the other female stresses, and it is assumed that all of that put together means that the females are just simply not as able to make a go of it. Um, mortalities due to, uh, due to calving, uh, to low energy because they've used up so much of their energy delivering milk. And uh, you come up with a, an animal that is under stress, add the environmental stresses and the entanglement and ship strike stresses. When an animal's struck, can it recover? And you probably explain uh, the 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 difference, but there may lurk behind that questions of of pollutants that are impacting females uh, and their production of milk. It's not a good picture. All right. Next question from Anna: Has there been a significant change in the right whale congregations in Cape Cod Bay as the whales have been seen more frequently in the Gulf of St. Lawrence? Yes, another important part of the story. What we have seen is in this time that we think, we can't prove, but we think 
is a period of um, of uh, uh, changing ecosystems. Uh, the Gulf of Maine is going through quite a change because of uh, the changes in climate. We know that from oceanography and a lot of other things. The result has been that w the distribution of whales has changed considerably. Um, and I should say also the distribution of scientists has changed. So sometimes you can't separate the two, but um, what we have seen is in the Gulf of Maine, there seems to be a substantial drop off in their old uh, fall um, uh, locations in the, uh, in the Bay of Fundy uh, off of Nova Scotia. Uh, there seems to have been a big drop off in the Great South Channel east of Nantucket. There has been a dramatic increase. We always have had a lot of right whales, but the increase has been very dramatic in Cape Cod Bay uh, and as has pointed out, the questioner is right. There's been a dramatic increase uh, in the in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, we try to make sure that isn't just because more scientists are going to those areas, um, and it does not seem to be the case. Um, so things are switching around, and all of that may not seem terribly important. It seems related to the distribution of food that I talked about before, but it is important at the base because management efforts by human beings tend to be boxes around places. Uh, and it turns out whales don't care what those, those illustrated boxes are. So in Cape Cod Bay, the whales are the most actively and heavily protected from all of their causes of mortality of anywhere in their whole distribution. But in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, Canada was caught off guard. They had boxes here and there in the Bay of Fundy and whatever. But when the whales began to show up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the management tools were not in place. And so if that were to go on and whales leave Cape Cod Bay and let's say end up off of Long Island, we would have a situation uh, not unlike the Gulf of St. Lawrence problem. And uh, the, that one problem resulted in tens of whales dying because Canada was trying desperately to keep up with management. As the whales change distribution, humans are slow to pick up on it. All right. Um, just a couple more questions that we have time for. Uh, Robert Roca asks, when the last flight was that we did? Right. Our last flight, I think, was, uh, oh, God, I just got it a moment ago. I think it may have been um, uh, in late um, in late March. Uh, so we're we're out of step uh, on our usual flight time. Uh, just before this meeting, I I uh, we may be trying to fly uh, with very strict controls on our pilots and our people uh in uh, as early as sunday and our research vessel may get out on monday uh we know right whales are here in numbers maybe large numbers and the hope is we'll be able to catch up with things and the hole in our information won't be too detrimental to management uh, all right from andrea can you talk a little bit about why it's important for boaters that come across an entangled whale to report it to the current agencies and not try to disentangle a whale themselves. Good point. Um, as you've seen, disentanglement, uh, it is not the ultimate answer to the whole business of entanglement because we lose a lot of whales. We don't see all of them that are tangled. <clears throat> but in the present format, because we still have entanglements going on, disentanglement is critical. Uh, and what is most critical is that disentanglement teams that know exactly how to do it uh, be informed at the Center for Coastal Studies or, if necessary, through the Coast Guard. Uh, the reason it's, it's important to do that is because we need to have people who know how to disentangle whales on site. Many times, well-meaning individuals try to disentangle, and all they do is they cut the line short and they leave gear on the whales 
which now uh, the gear is so short that the disentanglement teams can't get a hold of it. So very important to get a hold of, uh, of, of, of the right authorities and then stand by the whale if it's at all possible, because if, if you don't, we may not be able to find it. Uh, so very important to, um, uh, to report and then stand by. Um, just a, uh, for everyone who is listening, a uh, little bit of an advertisement here for people who are interested in the marine entanglement that we're doing. Um, actually, Monday at 2 p.m., we're going to have a Facebook Live where uh, one of the members of our merit team is actually going to give a tour of IBIS, which is our rescue boat uh, that we use for all of our marine animal entanglement responses. So if you want to check back in on Monday, you'll be able to learn quite a bit more about uh, entanglement itself. Um, so I think we have time for about two more questions here. Um, Heidi asks, is there any info on the whale and calf that was injured off the Florida coast? Right. Uh, yeah, there's a whale, um, that my team, I, I depend on all the ID work from, from again, my crack team at the lab, as you may know some of them, and, uh, they have identified as, as have other scientists, a female that was the first to give birth, um, the name, uh, Deresha. Uh, she is named Duresha, given a number, and she gave birth. Um, and the kind of the horror of it is, she gave birth uh, in, um, I think, in uh, the second week of January. And um, her calf, a very small animal by by whale standards, was struck by a boat. Um, in fact, before the flight team uh, working in Florida. Uh, saw them. So the calf on first observation, maybe a, a day old or so, was hit by a boat and a propeller, apparently it appears a propeller severed um, almost completely through the snout of the animal. Uh, and the little calf then had a big, a huge chunk of its snout sort of hanging. And everyone has wondered whether that calf, one of what turned out to be 10 born this year that we know of, uh, has lived. And the bad news is that neither Duresha nor her new calf uh, have been seen um, in southern waters. And we're hoping we will see her up here. Um, my people uh, who see an awful lot of calves and injuries um, have uh, have pretty much uh, the belief that the calf will not live um, because of the difficulty of, of nursing. But we haven't heard of it. Stay tuned because we may see Duresha up here and let's hope the calf is still alive. All right, I think we have time for about two more questions. So uh, Bertrand asks, does climate change affect the right whales? And if so, how? Well, you know, the whole climate change story, as you know, is extremely complex. The people doing the climate change work, the meteorologists and uh, climate specialists, uh, have their own problems trying to model it. And as has been pointed out by friends of mine who are on the IPCC, they can cons consistently underestimate the changes. So. Uh, even they can't get a good handle on it. Then if you translate that uncertainty into the Gulf of Maine, what we can say is there is strong evidence that the Gulf of Maine is undergoing very substantial change, maybe some of the biggest change happening, certainly along the Atlantic coast and maybe in the world. And obviously it's the home of these last right whales. Now, what is that doing to right whales? Unquestionably, in my mind, it's having an effect on the food that controls their distribution and ultimately controls the uh, the management um, of the of the of the issues that they that they confront. Uh, the problem is we can't say with absolute certainty what uh, the uh, the effects are. We can say that things are changing in the system and things are changing in the plankton and things are changing in the right whales distribution. But exactly how all those things fit is very difficult to show. I think I've mentioned earlier uh, the changes in distribution, which most of us believe 
are probably because of changes in the distribution of food, which so controls their, uh, their movements and activities. But, but to be sure of it uh, is beyond us and we're stuck with having to do science. Um, I think we can say climate change is here and its effects will be profound. And I expect sometime soon, maybe not far off, Cape Cod Bay, which is the center of right whale distribution, uh, will probably see a dramatic decline. I, I anticipate that likely due to climate change. All right. Uh, I think this is a great question to leave on. We have a question from uh, Leela, and she wants to know, is there any word on whether there is a measurable measurably less industrial marine noise via the hydroplane arrays um, with COVID and the shipping uh, and man manufacturer slowdowns. And then the second part of the question is how can we help press for better enforcement of shipping lane speed limits? Oh boy, that's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on the uh, on the sound one, an excellent question. Um, you may know that some remarkable things turned up and have been published showing how dramatically different during 9-11 uh, the acoustic environment was uh, where there were listening devices and pretty strong evidence that uh, the right whales responded by changing their vocalizations. Uh, some absolutely phenomenal work that has been done by people um, here in the Northeast. Uh, but I would say that relative to the present situation, I'm certain that there are some signals of this change um, in, the, uh, in the acoustic environment. Uh, and I know that people like Chris Clark um, and the folks at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center are looking at that, but the data are just really being uh, collected. So. I, I don't think we'll have to listen to them. I, I won't know that because we, do, we don't do the acoustic work, but my friends do. Um, as far as the, um, as the uh, ship speeds, uh, there has been a lot of effort. And you know, uh, there, a lot of the effort has been directed at, uh, as, as, as off of Cape Cod at uh, vessel speeds in shipping lanes. Uh, my worry is that a lot of the shipping traffic is not in shipping lanes. Uh, indeed, um, there is uh, the difficult problem that right whales are going to places that we don't even know about. And so it's pretty hard to manage them. If that's that business of them moving around and not being where we're managing them. Uh, and so it's a pretty tough um, uh, not to crack if you're going to try to control shipping speeds over, you know, over the whole transit of ships. Um, is there anything we can do about it? I think we can, uh, if we can find where there are aggregations, um, and that's partly what we're trying to do here at the center by flying to areas beyond Cape Cod Bay where we where we think there may be aggregations of right whales. And if those coincide with shipping lanes that are not controlled, we might be able, in fact, we will be able to slow boats down. But the problem is we don't know where a lot of the right whales are, except for today, they're probably in Cape Cod Bay. Um, and uh, outside shipping lanes, we, we know where ships are, but we don't know where the whale ship interaction is. So it's a tough one, but as information is collected by groups like ours and New England Aquarium and, uh, and in Canada, we'll get a much better idea where whales are and maybe uh, we'll have more dynamic ways of putting boxes out there. Right now, uh, humans are not good at this game and uh, we're good at killing them, but we're not good at saving them. All right. Well, I think on that, um, I want to thank you, Stormy, for uh, your time and for doing this. And I want to thank all of the people who uh, came on to watch this. And I also want to point out if you guys have any other questions that you think of, um, or if you're watching a recording of this on any of our other channels, at a later time, please feel free 
to put some questions in the comments. We're always watching uh, what pops up there, so we can do our best to answer any questions that you might have at a later time. Um, but for now, we want to thank you uh, again thank you guys. for being here. And, thank uh, you, guys. Yeah. Thank you, and stay safe. Yeah, absolutely. Stay safe, everybody, and check back in. We'll be uh, live again on Monday and Wednesday at 2 p.m., so we'll have some more great info for you guys and some uh, great, great presentations.